Turn on the volume of your TV, grab the beer you badly need, and listen carefully. There is no way to define performance art, especially when it is created by Mexicans. So depending on the context and the objective, performance artists utilize different media, different languages and metaphors to express his or her opinions, to challenge your outrageous misconceptions about other cultures, to destroy your sense of the familiar, to get you to think about yourself in a different way. Got it? I'm training to fight the PRI, the Border Patrol, formerly star critics, Obnoxious gentry fires, gentry fires. <sighs> so, dear Boyer, welcome to my house. This is a very unusual house. It changes constantly. At times, it is a salon where intellectuals get together and discuss ideas. Political activists, artists present work informally. Other times it becomes a rehearsal space when my collaborators and I, before going on the road, you know, we fine tune our performance pieces here right in the living room. I'll show it to you later on. You know, we bring in colleagues to criticize the work and then we hit the road, you know. We go on tour. Other times, it is more like an international hotel. Artists from all over the world, artists from Mexico, from Europe, you know, they come and visit, you know, and they spend two or three days here, hang out in the city, and then move on. Uh, and other times, it's like a roadside museum. So what you will see today, it's my strange collection of personal artifacts which are both objects that decorate the house and props for performance pieces and installations. Two other important functions that this house performs is uh, it is a love nest for my wife and I, a romantic love nest, and it is also an installation piece and we live inside of it. It's like living inside of your own artwork. But let me begin to show you some of the objects of this place. See, this is a classical poster. Super Barrio, the Mexican activist, is teaming up with Marvel Woman to fight AIDS, 1988. For me, it's important because there is a long tradition in Mexico of what I term performance activism. Activists who utilize performance techniques to distribute their ideas. You know, perhaps the most famous one is Subcomandante Marcos. Bring the camera up close. These are assorted witchcraft artifacts, talismans of sorts, to protect my back on the road. See, I am a migrant performance artist. I spend 70, 80% of the year on the road traveling from city to city, from project to project, from country to country, and I need some serious protection, especially when crossing borders. And throughout the years, shamans have given me these artifacts, and I really treasure them because I regard shamans as colleagues, you know? And in this sense, these are props to them. Perhaps the only difference between a shaman and a performance artist is that they utilize their props and rituals to heal, whereas we utilize them to diagnose social illness. Hey, check this too. This is El Maria Chiquen y la Cuban Jinetera. Eh? This is a very good example of a Mexican toy expropriating a U.S. icon, and a Cuban toy expropriating a U.S. icon. You know. They are also fairly 
vivid examples of cultural transvestism. Chicano folk art made in China. These are some of my favorite figurines. They are like alternative action figures. You know, here you have Saddam Hussein, you have Subcomandante Marcos, and you have a legless Mexican wrestler. But how do they get made? Well, probably in some garage in downtown Mexico City, a bunch of ingenious kids they take apart U.S. action figures and then reassemble them and substitute their faces for their own cultural heroes. This is, in a sense, guerrilla toy making. See, I really see myself as an alternative anthropologist, a reversed anthropologist. My strategy is to occupy a fictional center and push the dominant culture to the margins and treat it as exotic, as unfamiliar, as if it was a minority culture. So let me show you some of my archaeological artifacts. White trash fall cart. You know, an ugly tourist here in the left. Militiaman, wrestler, and right wing fall cart, a cop training his dog. I am also interested in collecting what I what I term old racist tobilia. You know, it's artifacts like these, you know, that curiously, since the backlash era begun, 1993, 94, these kind of artifacts have become collector's items for, for yuppies. You know, and for them it's a way to say, you know, I've had it with people of color telling me how I should look at them, you know. It is a way to say, you know, I am militantly, politically incorrect. Ahora, how do I obtain this stuff, you know? Two ways, you know, people give me stuff all the time. But also, you know, when I'm touring and I arrive in a new city that I've never been to, I put classified ads in the local paper. And I tell people, if you're interested in getting rid of your cultural guilt, you know, and donating to me that secret collection of Mexicanabilia or Indianabilia, Negrobilia, you know, call the following telephone number. And people do call. The strangest of my Mexican abilia collection is this tiny little, you know, greasy Mexican living inside of a peanut. Apparently it's from the 1920s. Conceptual velvet art. This racist depiction of a quote-unquote squaw was actually taken from a Hollywood movie still the 40s. And what we did in 1986 or 1988, we did a kind of guerrilla border art piece. We commissioned 20 of these paintings to a local painter in TJ in the pure kind of tourist velvet style and actually sold them to tourists. The evolution of the Vato from indigenous all the way to high-teca. Now, two examples of high barrio art from different periods. Here you have Marilyn Monroe, painted by a Tijuana velvet artist in the 60s. She looks a little bit mulata. And then here you have Lady Diana airbrushed by a lowrider in the 90s. And you can tell that she looks much, much better than she ever did in real life. So here we are in the most private part of the house, the bathroom. And this is Popeye joining the Day of the Death Parade. And I am sitting on a 
separatist toilet. You know, I always keep some makeup in the bathroom because I like to experiment with my identity on a daily basis. And of course, here you have Speedy Gonzalez, the grandfather of the Taco del Chihuahua. North Americans have mythical notions about the South that in despite of the fact that we are living inevitably in the same space that we have to coexist daily, you know, that we eat the same food, that we breathe the same air, that we walk the same streets, we are indifferent to one another, you know, we're invisible to one another, we bypass one another without acknowledging. I'm training, training to fight the PRI, the Border Patrol, formerly star critics, obnoxious gentrifiers. So, instant identity change. So easy to become a Mexican Indian. So here we are in front of our dresser. And I want to show you some things. Hybrid Vato Loco Indian head. He changes every week. We put on different hats, glasses, and collards on him. You know, this little wooden gun. It's a very ambiguous piece. On the one hand, it can be the ultimate metaphor against violence. A wooden gun? Just like the early Zapatistas in 1994, you know, would walk around the Chiapaneca jungle carrying wooden guns to make a point, you know. But then at the same time, it can be a toy from an NRA supporter household. You know, my work is permeated with Catholic imagery, you know. My colleagues and I have crucified ourselves to protest immigration policies, you know, crucifixion images of transgender mariachis appear in our diorama pieces, and my house is filled with crucifixes. Let me show you this unique collection of pagan crucifixes from different parts of the Americas. This is my favorite one an Indian crucifix from Oaxaca. My wallet, the original wallet of Speedy Gonzalez. And I'm gonna show you a very emotional piece. These are the actual hands of my beloved Carolina. She commissioned this heart to a barrio artist in East Harlem as a kind of love poem for me. And she utilized, actually, her own hands to mold it. By national boxing gloves. I use them to fight La Migra, the Border Patrol, the PRI, my own inner demons. I use them on a stage, and I use them on the streets. Over there, you have my outer ego. And then here, you have more shamanic artifacts. This is a Oaxacan witch mask very powerful. And here you have a conchero dancer turtle purse, a true nightmare for animal rights people. You know, in the 80s, the animal rights activists used to pick at my work all the time. They couldn't see beyond their hyper-specialized concerns. I, and they used to think that because I used taxidermied animals on a stage, and I used this kind of artifacts on a stage. I was some kind of, you know, perpetrator of animal cruelty. This is a shamanic belt made out of animal bladders. Handwoven Aztec high-tech boots, my personal heart, 
mariachi punk jacket, bolo tie with the Aztec calendar, techno glasses, heavy metal jewelry, border jewelry. The traveling medicine vato. The U.S. suffers from a severe case of amnesia. In its obsessive quest to construct the future, it tends to forget or erase the past. Fortunately, the so-called disenfranchised groups who don't feel part of this national project have been meticulously documenting their histories. Action. Mexico Tenochtitlan, 1992. 2,000 years of dreaming, 500 years of nightmare. I'm training still to fight the masterminders of globalization. The lords of racism. Here I am dressed as a quebradito, a Tex-Mex rocker. Every performance artist is a frustrated pop musician. You know, I got this suit in the late 80s. You know, it was commissioned to a New York tailor for one of my productions, and I've been wearing it since then. And this is one of my many bolo ties. You know, I want to talk a little bit about my collection of velvet paintings, conceptual velvet art. For about 15 years, I've been commissioning, you know, velvet paintings to traditional Tijuana velvet artists. You know, most of these velvet paintings are inspired by performance characters, and they end up inevitably in an installation, a performance piece. Uh, and the great paradox is that many of these paintings have been exhibited next to Van Gogh's and Matisse's. It's like a historical revenge. That's the Maori lowrider the very first velvet painting I ever commissioned, 1987, more or less. You know, and next to him, you have El Azteca from East LA, which is one of my performance accomplices, Roberto Cifuentes. Then you have Tinieblas, Mexican superhero and famous wrestler. And underneath Tinieblas, my last acquisition, this wasn't actually commissioned. I found it in a garage sale, and this sleazy British guy told me that it was, quote unquote, an authentic Aboriginal art. The performance never ends. Then over there you have the true illegal alien. And next to him, the yuppie bullfighter. You know, Roberto and I just came back from a long tour, last stop, New Mexico. So I, today in the morning, I opened my trunks and I pulled out some of the props we normally use in a live performance and I would like to show them to you. This is the robotic hand of El Mad Max, AKA El Mex Terminator. And it is meant to alter my identity, to deform it. A voluntad. Let me show you how it works. My power megaphone to perform in the streets and also 
to amplify my voice when necessary. My midget accordion. My colonial fan. Racist singing cactus. Chicken call. <laughs> My taxidermied identity. And over there, more third world erotica, a deranged mermaid from the state of Guerrero in Mexico. The Macarena singing gorilla, made in Hong Kong for export to the U.S. to be enjoyed by Chicano kids. An s and tribal whip. Roberto uses it to whip himself. And he also hands it to audience members willing to whip him. These are my favorite high heels. I use them for one of my performance characters, the androgynous shaman. Instant Mexican vampire. My power drink. Instant identity changes. My very first performance headdress a true performance relic. Instant backstage. El SNM Zorro, rejected by Hollywood. Super Mojado. Defender of immigrants' rights. Tecno Pachuco. Instant Mexican nationalist. Take a photo with an authentic roadside shaman. Pathetic tourist. The scalp of one of my many performance victims. Now I'm gonna show you two masterpieces of Latinobilia. You know, this piece, I call it the end of the wrestling match. It is a little composition, little installation piece I made with two figurines I found in Dolores Hidalgo, Mexico last year. You know, I mean, it's a kind of involuntary s and Indian feminist art piece, you know, where you see this man, you know, showing reverence to this indigenous woman with his pants down, and in fact, it is a toothpick holder. We're now in the living room area, and I want you to check out this triptych of pre- and post-Columbian forgeries. First, you have this authentic Mixteco god sold to me by a prop mistress for $40. Then over there you have, you know, a phony colonial saint purchased in Santa Fe or Santa Fake as original. And here you have you know, a clay figurine of Mickey made in Tijuana in the 60s. And the artisans never really asked Disney for permission to use the image. You got me. 
You've got the camera, do you know? Good evening, Gringolandia. Buenos dias, Europa. This is un noticiero de fin de siglo. 1,000 megahertz above reality. At the top of the news tonight, la sumisión binacional ha firmado un tratado de libre cogercio. President Bush has been diagnosed with Down syndrome. Pinochet falls but leaves a triple shadow behind. Super Barrio replaces Pérez de Cuellar at the United Nations. The Dalai Lama relocates to El Salvador. The Eastern Bloc goes west for shopping. Multiculturalism becomes a TV series. AIDS has finally affected the immunological system of the mainstream. The Heritage Foundation broadcasts Chin, Chin. Ya me equivoqué, que pendejo. I made a mistake. Let's just try it one more time, you guys. The dominant society perceives performance artists as irresponsible troublemakers and exhibitionists engaged in unnecessary extreme behavior. Can you believe it? But contrary to general opinion, performance artists are intellectuals. Intellectuals with big mouths, with utopian visions. They say things no one else is willing to say. And they're always looking for original ways to say them. One night I was beaten up by a biker gang from Hollywood. One of my first leading roles in an American thriller. They mistook me for a Colombian dealer, a Filipino boxer, a Libyan pachuco, a Hawaiian surfer. Who knows what they thought they knew? I've been mistaken so many times in America, but then, who hasn't? People here tend to mistake each other's identities. It's like a national sport. <laughs> 